Um, I'm looking forward to sharing one of my favorite topics. I mean, I, I just, I love this topic. It's just, I love this time of year. Um, because this is, uh, I feel like it's it, because it's the new year. Um, and I can tell you that um, doing some some farming and and things like that springtime comes around and there's just this this newness and um excitement i guess you know you're putting the seeds in the ground and um tilling up the garden and uh, the flowers are blooming and um it's just like the the whole world just came back from the dead <laughs> and things are turning green and everything's just beautiful and uh that's um, not that I don't like winter. I think there's a, a neat thing about all the seasons, but um, when springtime rolls around, it's, um, I guess, time for action, I guess you could say. And uh, so anyway, and the newness just fits so perfectly with Passover because that's, um, you know, the new year. And again, year after year, year after year, we're going to see a beautiful picture of our salvation through Yahshua, our the Messiah. Hallelujah. And so, with no further ado, the topic that we're going to discuss today, spiritual meanings of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, last week we did talk about the basics of what Passover is about and what it means to keep Passover. And so, if you missed that one, uh, make sure you go back and, and catch that study there on the archives at Eliad.com slash transcripts. And that's also linked from the main page there near the top left-hand side of the page. You'll see a link there to the archives. So uh, if you missed last week's study, um, um, you can go back and, and watch it again. Or not watch it again, but watch it for the first time. <laughs> and if you, if you wanted to, to hear last week's study again, of course you can't. All right, and so we're going to talk about this uh, this topic, the spiritual meanings of Pesach, is how you actually say the word in Hebrew, and uh, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we we want to talk about this because it's just a beautiful thing. I spent I want to spend a couple of weeks on this, and a lot of you who listen to this have, have go through this already year by year. Um, this is uh, let's see, I guess my twenty first Passover, but but I still don't get tired of it. I mean, it's still the topics and the things and the whole picture of uh, of everything is, to me, beautiful each time. And so uh, I love to talk about it. I love to, to read about it. And uh, I like to teach new folks about it, too. And so if you're you're new to this, um, some of these pictures and, and spiritual meanings and, and things you may have heard before, but hopefully some you're, you're going to grab in this time. Um, if this is your first year of actually keeping Yahshua being your Passover, uh, it'll develop even more of a meaning to you. Um, this awesome, wonderful feast. You know the the, the Christian uh, the Christian mainstream churches and so on. Um, their highlight for this time of year is that day they call Easter. And um, you know, sadly, even the word Easter. Uh, it appears comes from the pagan idol Astarte, which is the fertility goddess, uh, the female con consort, consort to uh, a lot of male gods, and um, and so there's these fertility symbols out there. You know, rabbits are very fertile, and um, you know, eggs, and you know, so on. So, but what we're looking at, the symbols that we're looking at, don't don't come from paganism. They come from the scriptures, and that means that they're far superior, far superior than what you're going to find in the uh, celebrations that uh, mainstream Christianity has picked up over the last couple thousand years. And so, now to me, one of the greatest testimonies as to the uh, correctness and rely, excuse me, rely, reliability of scripture is that the plan of salvation for every man, woman, and child on the earth is literally written 
in the history of a nation. The plan of salvation is literally written in the history of a nation. And it's a testimony to the unity of both the Old and what they call New Testaments. But the unity of Scripture is how I prefer to say it. Um, so the physical salvation of Israel from Egypt mirrors our own salvation that Yahweh offers us through Yahshua the Messiah. Now to me, only Yahweh could do something that awesome as to write his plan of salvation in the history of Israel. Uh, and so we're going to uh, examine some of these things. And, um, you know, the first thing we have to understand, you know, you ever heard of this uh, crime going out there called identity theft? Identity theft. Well, identity theft means someone steals your identity and takes it and runs with it and they... Um, try to pretend like they're you and they do all these other things. Well, there's another form of identity theft um, that is very common, has been going on for a couple thousand years now. Um, and that is that uh, people don't understand what their identity is, and so Satan steals that from them. People don't understand that once you believe in the, in the Master Yahshua, the Messiah, you have become a part of the nation of Israel. And Satan comes in and steals that away from you, uh, which causes all kind of harm to you, whether you realize it or not, because then you're going to have a tendency to distance yourself from Israel and distance yourself from its covenants, distance yourself actually from the Elohim of Israel. And, uh, and so we want to look at the scriptures and realize, as I've been sharing now here, that the ones who are the sons of Abraham, the ones who are Abraham's seed, are the ones who have given their lives, lives to the Messiah Yahshua. And uh, that's a very important thing. Scripture says that, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And it says, Galatians 3.29, and if you are Messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so if we are in Messiah, then we are Abraham's seed. There's no difference between me telling you that you are Abraham's seed and me telling you that you're Israel. Because Israel is Abraham's seed. And so we have to realize that we as believers in Messiah are joined to Israel, not replacing Israel, but joined to Israel. I'm talking about the one new man concept, Ephesians 2. We are Israel, no longer strangers to the covenants of promise, according to Ephesians 2. We're not aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We are brought near by the blood of the Messiah. Now, at the same time, we, we want to make sure that since we're Israel, that we also act like Israel and that we're behaving and being obedient like Israel is called to be. Many people want to receive all of Israel's promises. But then when it comes to Israel's obligations, they distance themselves. Oh, they want the, the, the promises given to the sons of Abraham. But, you know, the obligations, well, that's, that's just for sons of Abraham. That doesn't work that way. You have to have both the, the... If you want the obligations, you have to do your part of it. And so, um, now what what time of year, I mean, what, what are the dates for Passover? We're going to go over those real briefly here. This year, and it changes from year to year, uh, the day of Passover is going to be on the 18th of what the world calls April uh, fourth month of the year in the Roman calendar. And that will begin uh, what the world calls a Sunday night, uh, or the night of the 17th, because the, Yahweh's days begin at evening. And so, and then the 19th will be a holy day. No work is to be done. And uh, and that's when all the unle all the leavening should be out of your houses by then. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, please watch last week's broadcast. We'll touch on that this week also. But 
And then um, the 20th to the 24th are parts of the feast, but they are not days that you are uh, supposed to refrain from working, other than the fact that um, the 23rd is going to be a Shabbat, a regular Shabbat, seventh day of the week. So that will be a day you take off, of course. And then the 25th is a day you'll need to get off work as well. That's also a holy day when uh, no work is to be done. And if you're wondering what leavening is, um, here are some examples of what to get rid of in your closets and um, pantries and so on. The baker's yeast, active dried yeast, baking powder, baking soda, which is usually called sodium bicarbonate, cream of tartar, sourdough, um, ammonium, ammonium, ammonium carbonate, sorry I'm not very good at these pronunciations, <laughs> ammonium bicarbonate, potassium carbonate, potassium bicarbonate, and dipotassium carbonate. And so those are things that can leaven bread. If you are wanting to get rid of your yeast, anything with yeast in it, yeast extract, yeast this or yeast that, uh, I want to make sure you get rid of. And I will be le I'll be putting this list back up again a little bit later in the broadcast today. So uh, in case you didn't get a pencil or something. And of course if you email me I can send you the list as well. Alright, so if we read the book of Exodus... In the book of Exodus, chapter 1 and verse 9, I don't know what happened, but it looks like I lost my screen there for a moment. Let me take a look and see. Maybe the screensaver turned on or something. One moment, please. All right, so it uh, looks like the computer blanked out for one reason or another, but uh, I can continue on with the study today. But Exodus chapter 1 and verses 9 through 10, we'll get this back up here in a minute. Uh, it says, And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. This is Pharaoh. Uh, the children of Israel are increasing in size. In fact, so many of them, Pharaoh of Egypt began to be really afraid, afraid of what might happen if um, they be got, they got too large. And so their, his goal was, he says in verse 10, Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falls out any war, they join our enemies, fight against us, and so get up out of the land. That's a very interesting comment. They were, he was afraid that they would get out of the land. You'd think he'd be afraid that they would just take over the land. <laughs> but he was more concerned that they would leave. Um, and this is what causes me to think, you know, maybe, um, you know, he was a, he was really realizing he was getting blessed because of the children of Israel. Um, but anyway, there is a parallel here. Um, spiritually speaking, Egypt represents, from our, our perspective, in our own walk, Egypt is, you know, a picture of the world. A picture of the world. The world, um, the sin-laden world that we live in today. With all its glory and so on. And we know, at one time, Scripture talks about how we were in bondage to the world. And uh, we were in slavery to sin, to Satan, to the ruler of this world when we were in our sins. Now Satan is called the ruler of this world. Hold on one second. And so in John 16 verse 8, 
Yahshua talks about this. He says, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world. You see, the prince of this world, there was a prince of an ancient world named Pharaoh. And there's a prince of this world named Satan. And actually, he was behind the other one as well. That wants to put us in bondage and slavery to him. Uh, he wants, the enemy wants to be our king. Now, he's not in that position because Yahweh gave it to him. Yahweh did not give him that position of being king of this world or ruler of this world or prince of this world. Um, in the Garden of Eden, um, man was given the rulership over this world. Yahweh gave it to him and said, here, take dominion over the earth. But in that process, Yahweh chose, or man chose a leader for himself, Yahweh's enemy. And chose to walk in his spirit, chose to walk in the uh, doctrines and commandments of the enemy and his teachings, rather than teachings of Yahweh. And by that, the enemy has gained rulership over man. Now, we shall tread down serpents and scorpions and all these things, the scripture says. And, uh, and that we can take dominion over the world. Yahweh gave it to us. And so he's actually there illegally. Uh, this is not a world he was created to be ruler of. We were created to rule this world. Of course, Yahshua the Messiah, being a son of man, redeems us back to that place once more. And that's why we, we shall be kings and priests and so on. So, um, don't think, oh, well, you know, Satan, got he's the ruler of this world because he, you know, Yahweh, I mean, Yahweh allowed it, but Yahweh didn't want it. That was not his ultimate will. And so, he is the prince of this world, just as Pharaoh was the prince of the ancient world. Now, John 12, 31, I'll turn there in just a minute. I think I can get the PowerPoint back up now. John 12 excuse me John 12:31 Now is the judgment of this world This is when Yahshua was about ready to die for our sins Now the ruler of this world will be cast out It was Yahshua who redeemed us back to that position once more Now Satan's called the prince of this world in 2 Corinthians 4:3 but even if our gospel or good news is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the good news of the glory of Messiah, who is the image of Elohim, should shine on them. Now Pharaoh, as we mentioned before, is a representation spiritually of Satan. Because Pharaoh ruled Egypt, Egypt is symbolic of the world. We know Satan's always trying to destroy us, the predestined children of Israel, lest we be large in number. And he's always working against us. He's our enemy. And he does not want us to go out from underneath his control and his authority and submit ourselves to the king of Israel and go keep a feast to Yahweh. Yeah, Satan hates Yahweh's feasts. He hates them. And 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so, again, the only reason he has authority here is because people are giving it to him. If men would choose Yahweh as their Elohim, they would realize that Satan's not their ruler. 
And so he's not the ruler. Of, if everyone in this world chose Satan to be their ruler, of course he's going to be the ruler of this world. But if everyone chose Yahweh to be their ruler, then Satan couldn't do anything. Yahweh would be the ruler of this world. And this world would be a whole lot better place. And so the fact that men chose him to be their ruler is what makes him the ruler. But we are greater than he is. 1 John 4, verse 4, You are of Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so here the children of Israel were oppressed, they were afflicted, they were in bondage to slavery to the Egyptians, taskmasters, symbolic of demons, um, are afflicting those who are in bondage today. In many ways, we know Satan and his demons are trying to afflict men and bring men under bondage in the same way the taskmasters of old. And a lot of people don't even realize they're in bondage because they grow up in bondage and they don't know the difference. Now, as we've learned, Moshe was called by Yahweh to lead the children of Israel out of the land of bondage, out of the land of slavery, and promised to lead them to a land flowing with milk and honey. And that's the land uh, that we are all called to dwell in one day. And he's planning to lead us there. And one day, if we endure to the end, this is the place from which all, we will rule from. And all nations will flow from that place. And so, when Yahweh's will is done and the enemy is put in his place in the abyss, the bottomless pit, um, then man can't worship him anymore, and Yahweh will be the king. Uh, now Moshe's purpose was to lead them and show them the way to live so that when they inherit the land, they are not walking in the ways of Yahweh's enemy. This is the way of righteousness, the way of keeping and doing the commandments of Yahweh. Now this land flowing with milk and honey is very symbolic of what we are going through right now. It's the wilderness heading toward this place of rest. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14, and for we become partakers of the Messiah if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moshe? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned? Whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey. Obey what? Obey the Torah. And we see, so we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. You see, it's, it's one and the same. A dis people that do not obey are people that do not believe. Um, and so he concluded by the fact that they did not obey, that they did not believe. They go hand in hand. No one can say, I believe, and then intentionally just, who cares? I don't really care, whatever, just do whatever I want to do. Um, that's not belief. That's not faith. That's not faith at all. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. How could we? How would we come short of it? In the same way they did, disobedience to the Torah. And so we are admonished to not rebel and disobey Yahweh like they did, but to overcome, to inherit the kingdom that's promised to us, that promised land. And this scripture just illustrates that their trek from Egypt to the promised land is a mirror to the own road, our own road that we are taking individually. And Yahweh's plan of salvation through Yahshua and our walk with Yahweh today. And we're called to, as we are in this strange land, in this wilderness today, we are called to learn the Torah as they did and to walk in obedience to the Torah as they did as we walk this wilderness.
Now, while they were in bondage, Yahweh heard the cry of the children of Israel. He wanted to be delivered from their bondage. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, And Yahweh said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Isn't that interesting? He knows their sorrows. Um, I, when I think of that, I think of Yahshua, who was in all points tempted as we are, and so he was able to relate with us completely. He knows our sorrows, doesn't he? And so how many of us, I'm sure, know the, the bondage that, they, that they've been in? How many of us know the bondage that we've been in? Uh, the, the things that the, the enemy has basically led us to. Uh, one time in our life, we were in slavery. In slavery to this world with all of its burdens. And at some point, we chose to cry out to Yahweh, just like they did. We chose to cry out to Yahweh and ask for deliverance. Just as they cried out, they realized they're in bondage, and we realized we're in bondage, and we cried out. Well, as we're going to see, He delivered them. The manner in which He did deliver them is a whole lot like and a mirror of the way he delivers us. Now Moshe was Yahweh's spokesman. He was the mediator of the Old Covenant. Yahshua is a prophet like Moshe, but a mediator of the New Covenant. Now Pharaoh did not want them to go out of Egypt. Same is true of Satan. He does not want us to serve Yahweh and go keep a feast in the wilderness. He wants us to serve him and advance his works and do the kingdom and work for him and advance the kingdom he's trying to establish and so he has us working for him all the time before we came to to faith in Yahweh we're constantly building his kingdom we were getting the bricks and the straw and building his things that he's doing and we didn't even realize it until some point we thought you know what this is bondage this this world the slavery here is bondage um, but we were delivered from that bondage because we cried out to Yahweh in the same manner they cried out to Yahweh. And so we're delivered through that from that bondage. As we read the book of Exodus, we're going to see um, the way Yahweh demonstrated his superiority over all the gods and all the things of this world. Uh, we read a little bit about that last week. But you know, at some point in our life, Yahweh revealed to us his superiority over all the gods of this world, whether it be, you know, money, drugs, whatever. And so, the idols of this age, brothers, are all doomed for destruction. In the same way, Yahweh destroyed Egypt through the plagues. And they even said, uh, one of the Pharaoh's advisors says, Don't you yet realize that Egypt is destroyed? <laughs> Get this man out of here. Um, in the same way, um, he destroyed their idols and demonstrated his superiority. He wants to destroy any of the idols that we might have uh, in our own lives. Things that we used to cling to in the past. Now, this last plague that he poured out upon Egypt, Exodus chapter 11 and verse 4. Then Moshe said, Thus says Yahweh, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. The next day, I'm sorry, that was it. But um, so this this destruction of the the firstborn um, is exactly what uh, Yahweh delivered. 
uh, the children of Israel from. And um, now we know that Yahweh planned to put a difference between the children of Israel and the, uh, the Egyptians. And this difference is something that we need. Because one day Yahweh is going to destroy this earth, the, the people, the wicked people on this earth. And, um, and as a result of that, um, I'm sorry, not as a result of that, but we need, we need to, we need to be saved from that destruction. And so it's no secret that, um, Yahshua is called the lamb and in the same way they were delivered from destruction, we are also delivered from destruction. In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist said, The next day John saw Yahshua coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of Elohim who takes away the sin of the world. And we see Revelation 5. He heard the voice of many angels around the throne, living creatures, the elders, a number of them who was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And we see 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened for indeed Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Now many people refer to Yahshua as being the Lamb. We hear the Christian songs sometimes, Worthy is the Lamb. Um, but very few people understand why he is the lamb. He's the lamb because he is the Passover. He's the Passover lamb. And um, many will call him the lamb, but will ignore Passover. Instead, they observe a day named after an idol. Now, I, I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to celebrate his resurrection. That's not so bad. But, um, but you know, there's already a... a observance for that in the scriptures called the day of first fruits and that's when the barley is waved before Yahweh that's the first fruits of the barley harvest and um, of course Yahshua actually was raised I believe on the day of first fruits and that's why he's called the first fruits um, but most people do not recognize this I mean they they, they got this fog of 2,000 years of tradition that has kind of separated them from the fullness of Yahweh's word and the complete counsel of Yahweh's word. Now in Exodus chapter 12 verse 5 it says your lambs shall be without blemish a male of the first year you shall take them from the sheep or from the goats and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month then the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it between the evenings. And so, on the tenth day, they would take this, uh, tenth day of the month of Aviv, they would take this lamb, set it aside from the tenth to the fourteenth. Now, we understand the fourteenth of Aviv um, is obviously ten days after the time of the new moon. And, um, now, if you research it a little bit, uh, there's some back and forth, you know, maybe, maybe not. But it does appear that Yahshua uh, entered Jerusalem on Aviv 10. And uh, while he was there, he was examined by the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. And, um, and he was discovered to be without blemish. And the same is true about this Passover lamb. It had to be without blemish. That's why they set it aside for four days to make sure it wasn't diseased or something, uh, some kind of blemish was in it. And so we were not redeemed with corruptible things, First Peter 1 Peter 1.18, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Messiah as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. And if we examine Yahshua, his life, the way he lived it, we will also see he was without spot. And he is worthy of being 
the, pa- the, lamb, the lamb, the Passover lamb. Worthy is the lamb. Um, now, it helps a little bit if we realize that in ancient times, um, t- to give up one of your lambs, there was actually a monetary sacrifice involved in that. That's why it's called sacrificing. Uh, you're giving part of your money, basically, uh, to Yahweh. And so, um, it was something that was significant to give up one of your lambs. Now, ultimately, of course, it was Yahweh who provided the lambs. Uh, and he's the one who obviously provides our Passover lamb. So we can be saved from death. Now, take a minute and consider this example here. Genesis chapter 22, verse 6 through 7 So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son Elohim will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Now we know the story. Abraham uh, did not end up have to offer his son. Uh, His son was apparently um, just totally trusted his father to lay there on an altar and and get ready to be a burnt offering. But um, we know that they discovered a ram in the thicket. And so um, we know that Yahshua the Messiah um, he was crowned with thorns, wasn't he? And um, I know from raising sheep, actually the horns can grow out uh, a good bit there the first year. And so it's quite possible what they found in the thicket amongst the thorns was a ram of the first year. And um, and if that isn't a, a beautiful uh, picture of the Messiah, um, and uh, for all we know, that may have even been Time, around the time of Passover. Ever thought about that? Um, now, for ourselves, Yahweh says, Israel is my firstborn. Uh, Yahshua was a firstborn. And, um, and so he was offered in our place. And these lambs of the first year, I don't know if they necessarily need to be firstborn, but they did have to be of the first year. And so, Abraham and Isaac, by faith in the word of Yahweh, were obedient. And for that, Abraham was very blessed. Hebrews eleven seventeen through 19 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that Elohim was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in the figurative sense. And so Abraham understood that even if he did kill Isaac, Yahweh would just raise him back up again and bring him the seed he had promised. And he received Isaac in a figurative sense, uh, because basically he went through the same things in his mind. But instead of having to do that, he offered up the ram Instead, so Yahweh did provide the lamb, didn't he? Now, Exodus chapter 12, verse 6 talks about the timing of the Passover lamb. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it between the evenings. Between the evenings. Uh, Now, most translations will say at evening or twilight or something. Um, my understanding of that particular uh, verse, their section between the evenings would be at that same time that Yahshua was killed, which was the ninth hour of the day. Yeah, I don't think if I must not have got that scripture up there, but uh, Matthew twenty-seven twenty-four makes a statement that, um, not Matthew 27, but Matthew makes a statement about uh, Yahshua dying at the ninth hour of the day. Now, um, if it weren't for our sin, we know that Yahshua would never have to die for us. 
And so, in the same way, the whole assembly, the congregation of Israel, uh, had to provide this lamb um, that would bring about, you know, this this lamb that would be offered. In the same way, the whole assembly, the congregation of Israel, uh, testified against Yahshua and uh, basically said, uh, crucify him or impale him or put him to death, as we see there in, Ma in um, Matthew 27. Looks like I don't have that one up there either. Sorry, it's been a wild week for me. <laughs> but basically, Matthew 27, 24, when Pilate saw he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. Then he answered all the people and said, His blood, the, the people answered, His blood be upon us and upon our children. And so the whole assembly of the congregation basically took part in the killing of Yahshua, the Passover lamb. Now the Gentiles were not without um, sin because Yahshua said, Well, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. But it didn't say anything about Pilate being sin free, even though he tried to wash his hands of it. But you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing that Yahshua's blood's upon us, is it? And if his blood wasn't upon us, we would not be saved. It's his blood that cleanses us and and from all sin. Now, next is chapter twelve, verse seven. If I hopefully I have it up there. <laughs> um doesn't look like I have it. I don't know what happened. Maybe I got it down the list here somewhere. I don't know. Ah! Now we're in the right place. Okay. Well, there's Matthew 27 for you. Um, but verse, And we know that the they would take the this blood of the lamb and they would strike it on the doorposts of their house. Now, Yahshua, he made a statement in, chat, in the book of John... If I have it up here, um, doesn't look like I do. I don't know what happened here, but uh, somehow I ended up missing some verses. But Yahshua said in John chapter 10, verse 9, he said, I am the door. By me, if anyone enter in, he shall be saved and go in and go out and find pasture. Um, now, to me, one of the uh, awesome things is um, is realizing, okay, yeah, she was the, uh, the door, and of course his own blood was on the door, right? And it's through him that we are able to uh, find pasture and find salvation and be his sheep. Um, anyway, one of the clearest, clearest evidences to me that we ought to be keeping these feast days is in the commanded observance of the Memorial Supper where Yahshua the Messiah sat down with his disciples, often called the Last Supper. Um, the, uh, he sat down with his disciples, and he taught them how to observe Passover. Now, most people in this world will call it the uh, Eucharist, the Communion, um, the Last Supper, or whatever, the Master's Supper, or whatever they call it. Um, but it's actually Passover. And uh, this is a uh, observance that enables us to partake of the Passover lamb. Uh, a lot of modern theology wants to divorce Yahshua from being uh, this the service that Yahshua instituted from being a part of, of anything other than just some new service invented out of thin air. Um, but we see Yahshua made a statement in uh, Luke chapter 22, if I have it here. <laughs> Luke chapter 22 in verse 15. He said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of Elohim. They took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of Elohim comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which was given is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And so do this in remembrance of me. The true Passover uh, is going to be eaten with unleavened bread because the Passover, Exodus 12, was to be eaten with unleavened bread. They did not have time to let their doughs rise and so on. Now the leavening, as we see in a number of scriptures, represents sin. We know there's no sin in Yahshua. And he's commanding us to do this in remembrance of him. We know he died at the time of Passover, as we shared last week. And we partake of that bread. We're breaking that bread to remember Yahshua's broken body when? That died on Passover. It was for our sin Yahshua came into the world and died. And so if we're going to do this remembrance of him, when are we going to do that? The anniversary of his death. So if he died at this ninth hour, then that evening we partake of the Passover. That's when we partake of him. So now I know different people have different views on that. I'm not going to get into the timing issue. But uh, he did not die for us every Sunday. He didn't die for us every month or every quarter. Uh, that's, there's no anniversaries going on here on a Sunday. He died on the day of Passover. And so he is our Passover. And that's how we need to look at it. Now Yahshua's body is representation of Yahweh's word. John 1.14 The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Beautiful. And so Yahshua is the word of Elohim made flesh which dwelt among us. The word of Yahweh, as we knew, convicts us of our sin. Shows us what our sin is. When partaking of Yahshua's body, we're partaking of him, which is partly of the word, because he is the word made fle flesh, right? We partake of his flesh, we're partaking of the word, because the word was made flesh. And so, when we partake of that word, now you'll notice unleavened bread, when you when you take it this year, you take the unleavened bread, it's extremely dry. Uh, and we realize that bread is very dry. We, we are thirsting for something. We see also in uh, John 6, 47, Most assuredly I say to you, who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. And so bread being symbolic of Yahweh's word, symbolic of the Messiah, Again, Isaiah 55, another example. And this is so true. Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. And so we partake of that good bread. The word of Yahweh. We know that man does not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. And since Yahshua is the word. It's by him that we live. Revelation 10.8 um, I guess I missed that one too. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with these scriptures, but here we go. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I, I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I'd eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about people's kings, people's nations, tongues, and kings. Now, Yahshua makes this statement in John 6.49. He says, Your father ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which comes down, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. 
and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So knowing that bread represents the word of Yahweh, the word of Yahweh is manifested in Yahshua the Messiah. When we partake of that bread, it's representation of partaking of the word of Yahweh. That's what reveals our sin. The word of Yahweh is not sin. People think, oh, that law is a bad thing. Romans 7, 7, which we say, is the law sin? Certainly not. On contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law has said, do not co covet. And so the Torah reveals to us our sin. And once we have our sin revealed to us, just as once we partake of that bread, we thirst for something. And when the word of Yahweh is revealed to us, it causes us to thirst for something. Redemption. Because when we partake of that word, we realize how undone we are. How much of a heathen we have been. How much of, of what kind of wicked men we've chosen to be. And women, wicked women we've chosen to be. So, that's the beauty of it. Even the unleavened bread and the dryness of the unleavened bread is symbolic of the need for that thirst for redemption. And that's why we partake of the fruit of the vine, symbolizing the blood of the Messiah. Because once that word convicts us, it points us to the need for Yahshua's blood to cover and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we don't even know we're unrighteous. Everyone talks about the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb. But unless you partake of that word, what good is it? You don't even know what you're being redeemed from. You don't even know what wrongs that you've committed that you need to be saved from. And so we need both the word and the blood. We need both redemption. First, we have to be shown what our sin is. And sin is defined because he is the word made flesh that dwelt among us. What was the word up until John 1.14? The word that became flesh, the Torah, the Old Testament, they call it, became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's that word that we're partaking of. He is the living word uh, that gives us redemption. And so his life, because the the life is in the blood, Scripture says. His life comes in to us in such a way that it's no longer we who live. It's the Messiah, Yahshua, who lives in us. And our faith in Yahshua brings us cleansing and justification no matter what our sins were. Now, um, one thing I noticed here a few years ago when I went to Israel was um, they always prune the vines before Passover. It t you know, Yahshua talks about in one place how uh, we are, he's the vine, we are the branches. Well, they prune the branches off just before Passover. And, um, and I think that's kind of interesting because that's a time when, when uh, we need the pruning is just before we partake of that blood of the Lamb. That's supposed to be a very serious occasion we don't take lightly. And so um, I know that from experience that uh, pruning the vines there in Israel, which we actually did, um, that when you're finished pruning that vine, you look at it and look, look a bunch of stubs on and that's it. Like you, the only thing there is a few stubs and honestly, it looks like you just killed the plant. Uh, I couldn't believe how much they were taking off. And uh, But it looks totally decimated. But what happens is it even bears more fruit. And um, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, after, that, after I left Israel, I got home. And, and almost immediately, I began to be pruned. Uh, Yahshua was pruning me after that time. And... Um, and during that pruning time, I learned a lot. And um, well, we got back about a year, about a year later. 
uh, I met with one of the brethren that uh, that I had met in Israel, uh, and uh, and I tell, explained this to him how I got pruned, and he says, "Well, have you heard about the second pruning?" <laughs> I said, "What? <laughs> what are you talking about a second pruning?" He says, "Yeah, after they start uh, growing branches and so on." Um, there's some that look like they're going to bear fruit and some that don't, and so they cut the ones off that that won't bear any fruit. That way the ones that do bear fruit will actually bear more fruit. And that's actually, I think, the one Yahshua was talking about. So uh, I guess, and then I got my second pruning. In fact, I'm in the middle of my second pruning right now. So um, I'm sorry for the uh, confusion today. But anyway, um, our faith in Messiah... And I, that's okay. We need pruned. And then uh, we will be able to bear even more fruit. That's the purpose of our pruning. And so um, you've heard of the, you know, the blood of grapes. Um, and Yahshua, when we partake of him, we're taking of the blood, blood of the, because he's the vine, we're the branches, so on. And we're partaking of him, the body of Messiah, and we are the body of Messiah. And so this all gels together perfectly when you understand Passover. Uh, scripture talks about, again, blood of grapes, um, and we're called to bear fruit, and we are the branches of this vine tree, this vine, not tree, but vine, and we're called to bear this fruit, and we're a part of the body of the Messiah, aren't we? It says we are. He's the head of the body, but we're part of the body of Messiah, and we partake of the fruit of the vine and the bread, we're partaking of the body of Messiah, and so we're partaking of Him, and this all just comes together as you know in the vineyard. And I never realized these things quite like this until um, I went over there. But when you start clipping those vine, those branches off just before Passover, getting it ready, and um, that's just kind of interesting. But anyway. Getting back to Exodus 12, hopefully I have it up here on the screen, verse 46. Talking about the um, Passover lamb, it says, In one house it shall be eaten, you shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And so we also find Yahshua, our Passover lamb, in John 19:32. His legs were not broken. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Yahshua and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So it makes sense why, Yahshua, why Yahweh commanded that you do not break the lamb's bones. Because we see Yahshua written all over Passover. You can't escape it. He's written all over it. And uh, the children of Israel were also to eat this Passover... As it says in Exodus 12:11, in haste. He says, Thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. And so the lamb itself is called the Passover. The Passover was and is the one who died for us. The Passover lamb is what dies for the children of Israel. The Passover lamb... Yahshua is who dies for us. Now they were supposed to eat it quickly because they're um, going to be departing from Egypt that night. Well, we also need to be quick to leave Egypt, don't we? To get out of it. I mean, go way, way away from it. And, uh, and have that willingness to partake of the Passover lamb and trust that his blood is going to deliver us from death and damnation. And so again, Yahshua clearly uh, beautifully pictured in this Passover. Now, after Passover, Leviticus 23, verses 5 through 7, are called the days of unleavened bread, seven days. The fourteenth day of the first month at twilight, or between the evenings, is Yahweh's Passover. On the fifteenth day of the same month, it is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to Yahweh. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. And so we remove the leavening. And, uh, oh, sorry. 
he says, uh, continue to read here, verse 8, But you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. And so we remove all the leavening from our homes. Before the feast, we do not, do not eat any bread with leavening in it. Or anything with leavening in it. In fact, there's no leavening on our property uh, during this feast. Well, I should say almost every year we find something we missed. You know, it just seems to me there's a picture here of um, the more complicated our lives are, um, the more complex and the more stuff you have, um, the harder it is to get rid of that leaven. Isn't that true? Now, Yahweh did not want any leaven to be found in our homes, according to Exodus 12, 18. First month, from the first day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses, for who, since whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's a stranger, it's a Gentile, or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. And so no matter who you are, stranger, born in the land, you do not eat unleavened bread during Passover. Do not eat leavened bread during Passover, Jew or Gentile. Um, and so no work is to be done except to prepare the meals. As we read earlier, uh, he said that we are allowed to prepare our meals. Exodus 12 um, 16. I guess I missed that one. Oh, here we go. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. On the seventh day shall be a holy convocation. For you no man of work shall be done on them, but that, or except that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. And so we're going to keep the feast to Yahweh. And what's so beautiful about the feast is it's so symbolic of our walk with Yahweh. The bondage and the leavening of sin. We know a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The mercy of Yahweh with the lamb and the blood on the doorposts and even the bitter herbs. During the Passover we partake of bitter herbs and it represents the bitterness of our bondage that we had in Egypt um, when we were in slavery. And that's why we felt the need to be delivered. We cried out to Yahweh and he saved us by the blood of the Lamb. And so the promised land, in the same way they went through this time of, uh, they, they left Egypt, they were baptized in the Red Sea, and then the Spirit led them by a, a cloud by day and a fire by night through the wilderness in the same way we're in the wilderness. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful picture. Um, all right. Now, I want to zero in here a little bit on uh, Matthew 27. Um, I, did, I did mention to you, I would show you the leavening agents once more. These are the different kinds of leavening agents that you can find out there. Again, baker's yeast or any, any form of yeast. Um, yeast extract, active dried yeast, baking powder, baking soda, or sodium bicarbonate. Cream of tartar is also called potassium bitartrate sourdough, ammonium carbonate, um, ammonium bicarbonate, potassium carbonate, potassium bicarbonate, and dipotassium carbonate. And so, all right, Matthew 27, verse 46. It says, About the ninth hour, Yahushua cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my Elohim, my Elohim, why have you forsaken me? You know, in the old days, they didn't have these little handy chapter verses. You know, they, if, if, a, if a, uh, a Jewish man wanted to say, Hey, turn to Psalm 22. <laughs> uh, no one would understand what he's talking about. Um, the way they were able to tell you, okay, what psalm should you turn to, was to say the first verse in that psalm. And uh, Yahshua here basically is saying, go read Psalm 22. 
Go read this Psalm 22, my L, my L, why have you forsaken me? Now, if you take a moment this evening, read Psalm 22. It is an awesome, awesome prophecy and picture of the Messiah. Now, some of those that stood there when they heard that said, This man is calling for Elia. And, and uh, that's because he's saying, Eli, Eli. They think he's saying for Elia. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let us alone. Let's see if Eli will come and save him. And Yahushua cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now, the thing I want to point out here is the ninth hour. Matthew 27. That's the time when the Passover lambs are being sacrificed, as we spoke about last week. Now, in Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, verse 7, another prophecy of the Messiah. It says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now, if you continue to read through uh, the next verse here, you'll see, and I'm sorry, 53 verse 10, that Yahshua was that offering that, that was made for us. And Yahshua is that uh, sin offering, or that lamb offering that, saves us from death. And of course he died at that ninth hour. Now, but all start all this needs to start with the recognition that we are Israel. And when we recognize that we are Israel, then we can recognize that this new covenant is made with us. Most people don't realize the new covenant is only made with Israel and Judah. But it is. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. Now, forgiveness of iniquity is very important and that's also part of this new covenant. This new covenant. And they will teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Yahweh, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith Yahweh, says Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Now, forgiveness of sin and iniquity, and the blotting, forgiveness of iniquity and blotting out of sin, is very connected to this new covenant. And that's what Yahshua made possible for us. And that's why he is the mediator of this new covenant. Now, because we are Israel through him, we can join ourselves to this new covenant even if we are a Gentile. And Yahshua is the one who makes it all possible. And that's why he is the mediator. He's the one that makes us Israelites. He is the one who forget, it makes it possible for our sins to be forgiven. Now, when we receive the Messiah Yahshua, that means we left our sin behind. And that's why we keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. When we partake of the Passover lamb, and that 
Messiah now is dwelling in us, that unleavened Messiah, that sinless Messiah is dwelling in us. And that next seven days, then we enter into this feast of unleavened bread. And we can rejoice that now we are without sin through him. And to me, it's just a beautiful picture. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Again, your glorying is not good. Do you not know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, since he was sacrificed for us, what happens? After you partake of the Messiah, after you partake of the Passover, you keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And people say, well, it never says in the Bible to keep the feast. Well, here's one. But first you have to understand that Messiah is our Passover. You partake of the Passover, and then, therefore, let us keep the feast of unleavened bread, the one that has no leavening in it. And so... The two observances are connected strongly together here. First we have the Messiah, our Passover, being sacrificed for us, of which we become partakers. And then we then we have the feast of unleavened bread. And that's why he says, therefore, let us keep the feast. And so who's he writing to? He's writing to Gentiles. But in order for us to receive the Messiah... He's not a, um, he's not, you know, passing out salvation like he's passing out cards or something, or, you know, just throwing anyone who happens to land on is the one that ends up with salvation. Um, there's something that we need to do first. And to me, this is as much an important part of, of Passover as anything, and that's turning our backs on Egypt. We've got to turn our backs on Egypt and walk away from it. And so when we partake of the, the true Messiah, the first thing we have to do, when we partake of the, of the spiritual lamb, first thing we have to do is repent. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yahshua the Messiah for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's another indicator of, um, you know, we enter, we become a part of the body of Messiah, therefore we can partake of the body of the Messiah. Now, the waters of baptism separate us from Egypt, the world, and represents the death of that old man, the resurrection of the new man. And as the children of Israel were indeed baptized when they came out of Egypt through that water in the Sea of Reeds, at that very moment, when they, when they got on the other side of that water, and that sea closed up, it was official. They were out of Egypt. In the same way is true when we partake of baptism. When we, when we partake of that baptism, that's it. We've made our decision. We now are separated from the world. Now we, we are a new person. And actually, Scripture talks about this very thing, about them entering baptism. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, My brother, brethren, I sh should not that you should be ignorant. I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers, sorry, I'm reading from the King James here, were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moshe in the cloud and in the sea. And so we receive this watery baptism, and also the cloud being the spirit of Yahweh, the baptism of of the Ruach HaKodesh. In the same way they are baptized in the cloud and the sea, so are we. And as they saw the bodies of the old men of Egypt being buried in the waters and coming up to the shore, not able to harm them any more, our old man dies. A new man rises up, separating from us from Egypt once and for all. And so what happened to them when he baptized them in the sea and in the cloud? What happened? Was he finished with them? Was that all? No, he started to teach them his Torah. 
He started to teach them his Torah and his righteous ways. He tested them. He, he taught them, and then he tested them. And through it all, in the same way, the children of Israel, they ate the manna. We need to find pasture on that heavenly manna. Yahshua, our, the Messiah, our Savior. And feed on those words that give us everlasting life. And we also need to be led by the Spirit of Yahweh through this strange land, through this wilderness that we're in. This land that doesn't belong to us. It's just strange. And the only reason it doesn't belong to us is because it's being overrun by wickedness. And uh, it's not under the headship of Yahweh. And so we're going to endure these tests and trials and tri tribulations and temptations as we go through this wilderness. This is part of the wilderness experience. This is what we signed up for. This is the hard part. This is the difficult part. A lot of people think that once you come to Yahshua, then everything gets easier. Wrong. It immediately gets harder. Now, in some ways, it's a, lot, it's a whole lot better. But it gets harder. Life gets more difficult in many ways. Because now we have to strive. We have to go against the grain. You have to swim up current. you got to go through this wilderness, through this testing experience. And it's sort of like the... Uh, all right. We're getting education here. We're getting education. Like we're going to college and um, in the hopes and we're going to go through the, you know, and go fight through blood, sweat and tears and get all this understanding and, and be able to, to do what's what we're being taught so that at the end we graduate and uh, and be able to attain the greater riches. And so that's what we signed up for. And so if you seem like you know, since you became a believer, things have gotten more difficult. That's the way it is. Uh, it is more difficult. But it's worth it. He's worth it. And as we as we walk through this wilderness, um, Paul the Apostle encourages us. It says, All did eat the same spiritual meat. Talking about the children of Israel. We're uh, just actually uh, continuing on from the previous verse. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Messiah. But with most of them Elohim was not ple well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. You know, I've seen my share of bodies scattered in the wilderness. How about you? We've also, I hope I'm not one of them one day. Um, but... Those bodies you see scattered in the wilderness are examples. Both in the Torah and in our own lives. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 21,000 or 23,000 fell. And so, I don't know why that verse is up there, but uh, I want to continue to read here. Um, neither be idolaters, I'm sorry, ne neither let us tempt the Messiah as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur you as some of them complained and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened for our examples, for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. There is no temptation that has, overtake, has taken you, but such as is common to man. But Yahweh is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able to bear. But with every temptation will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my nearly beloved, flee from my idolatry. I speak to wise men, judge what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of the Messiah? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the blood of the Messiah? There it is. Verse 
verse 17. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partake of that one bread. And so we see here that their walk and our walk is very much the same. Do we see the Messiah in their example, the Lamb, and their walk and the things that they went through? I see it. We need to be obedient and not be like them. We see the uh, we see that the Messiah Yahshua followed them, and because they were not obedient, they were destroyed. What do you think is going to happen to us? Do you think that that we're better than they are, or that uh, somehow Yahweh will judge with partiality if we do as they did, and He won't judge us, but He did judge them? There's no difference. He's not going to be partial to anyone. And so we have to be obedient and not be like them. There are examples of what not to do. We need to make sure that we're not making their same mistakes. And so the cup of blessing, he says, what we bless is not the communion, the blood of Messiah. And so we're all partaking of that one bread together. And so to me, all these things speak of unity. Unity of the scriptures. Unity of all of us to the scriptures. And we can't allow the tests and the trials and tribulations that we go through in this land cause us to fall into disfavor with Yahweh. The mo one of the most important things is to not complain when, when trials come. Just overcome. Overcome those trials. And always remember, no matter where you are, Yahweh's leading you. Because he... He's got the spirit. That cloud is in front of you, and he's leading you. And so if he led you there, don't complain about it. And so we can't complain about our circumstances, and that's what they did. They complained. They murmured in their tents. We don't want to do that. And so now if we're not walking where Yahweh led us, we say, oh, well, I can complain because the cloud did not lead me here. Well, if you didn't follow the cloud, then it's still your fault. So you still can't complain. <laughs> so either way, we don't have the right to complain. Uh, if we didn't follow the cloud, then we're eating the fruit of our own doings. One thing we ought to do is rejoice in all things and let everything be done without murmuring and without complaining. Yahweh said to the children of Israel, he said, uh, he humbled you aloud, or actually Moshe spoke, he said, He humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. Do we believe that? That we will live by his word, we will live. Every word that proceeds out of his mouth. Or do we pick and choose, well, that's Old Testament, that we don't live by that word anymore. No, he says, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh, that's what we live by. And so we partake of that word through the reading of the word and the applying of that word in obedience to that word. We also partake of that word, that bread, Yahshua the Messiah, that brings us the righteousness we need and we will live forever. And so we, as children of Israel, are in a time of learning. That means you have to be patient with your brother because he's learning just like you're learning. He may not learn as much as you in one area, but he may know a whole lot more than you in another area. We're all learning different things at different times. But... We're learning the Torah. Well, either way, we're learning His teaching, His laws. And we're advancing to that promised land where Yahweh will reign and He will be the King. And we keep our eyes on that joy that's set before us. If we start looking around the wilderness too long, or worse yet, looking back to Egypt, then... We're going to end up walking there eventually. Because your heart follows after your eyes a lot of times. 
Now, um, I've been to this land of Israel, thankfully. A, a dear brother took me there one year. And uh, you might think, you know, what's, when, when you first get there, you know, there's a lot of barrenness, dryness. But there's also a lot of beautiful, green, lush, uh, it may surprise you, uh, but very beautiful, green, lush, fertile land there. Uh, in some land, it looks like you're in the state of Pennsylvania. Other land looks like you stepped into the backside of a, a barren desert. Other places, you got desert dunes, you have desert mountains, you have a huge lake in the Sea of Galilee, you have uh, mountains 3,000 foot high, you have hills a few hundred feet high, you've got a mountain almost 10,000 feet high, and Mount Hermon with, a, with snow on the top, and people go skiing there. You have the Golan Heights, which is the north side of Israel. It's very, very fertile, very beautiful. Most of the farming comes out of there. A lot of farming does. Uh, it just, Israel, as I kept saying to my brother who was with me there, um, Israel has it all. <laughs> and so Yahweh in this one little land, you can drive it all in one day and see it all in one day. Um, just show the, a showcase of the different kinds of topography, different kinds of climate, different kinds of land that Yahweh had has throughout the whole earth and so um, it's a it's an awesome place and I, I can't wait to live there forever I think it's gonna be a whole lot more fertile major landscaping work if you read Zechariah 14 Yahweh is going to be doing over there <laughs> it's gonna flatten out the whole land southwest of Jerusalem and Jerusalem will be raised up and um, above the nations and it'll be a beautiful sight that you can see from far away but um, you know what one thing we got to remember, Moshe did not lead them into the promised land. He led them through the desert, but he did not take them across to Jordan. I think there's a lesson in that. Because the truth is, Moshe can show us how to live in this wilderness and what the kingdom is going to be like and how people are going to be expected to live when we get there. But Moshe himself was imperfect. Moshe himself made a mistake and was not allowed to enter that land. And so what did it take? A man named Yahshua. Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, Joshua, son of Nun, the, the word Joshua comes from the Hebrew word or name Yahshua, which is spelled exactly the same way as the Messiah's name. So we have Yahshua, son of Nun, and Yahshua HaMashiach, Yahshua the Messiah. And um, it just seems to me Yahweh's awesome, perfect plan, and another man named Caleb, called Dog, was allowed to enter in. And what are Gentiles called? Dogs. Okay, so representative from Israel and represented from the Gentiles in a spiritual sense, a figurative sense, they were allowed to go in. Um, but what I think the lesson here is, brothers, is that while Moshe can show us righteousness and the right way to live, how Moshe can reveal to us what righteousness is, he cannot make us righteous. He cannot take us across. We will not be able, by our law keeping, earn our way across the Jordan because we've all broken the law. It's going to take a man named Yahshua to carry us and lead us across the Jordan. And I think that's exactly the picture that we need to be looking at. Is even though we, yes, we do want to be obedient to the Torah. Our obedience to the Torah is not going to cut it. We're going to need a man named Yahshua ultimately to take us across to Jordan, to fill us with his righteousness. And uh, that's another way Yahshua is able to be seen in this trek of Israel going from one place to another. Our, our whole plan of salvation is written in this. Now Moshe himself was not perfect. 
How did he sin? We know he struck the rock, right? And it says in John 19.34 how one of the soldiers struck his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. Well, yet when Moshe struck the rock, water came out. And Moshe himself, being a sinner, struck the rock. And you know what? In a sense, we've all struck the rock because of our sin. And we brought this need for Yahshua to come to us and die for us. And so I don't think all this imagery is just an accident. I think it's done for a purpose. To show Yahweh's plan for us, his awesome plan. To show how awesome he is. That he can write the plan of salvation in the history of the nation of Israel. So we... We look at the example of Yahshua and we want to walk as he walked. You know, one day we may have to lay down our lives also, just as he laid down his life. As it's, and so we walk as he walked, not just in our obedience to the Torah, but also in our willingness to die before we would ever consider disobeying his Torah. And so if we don't, but if we're not willing to walk as he walked, we got to follow him, right? we got to follow the shepherd across the Jordan. Um, we're not going to go where he's going, where he is. And Yahweh showed us his righteousness through Moshe, but he showed us righteousness by example through Yahshua. He's a living Torah. Now if the Torah, the law is in our hearts according to the new covenant, it's going to reflect in the outer layer through obedience to that Torah. And Yahweh, he wants to place that righteousness in us and give us the power to live a sinless and endless life. And so, why don't we examine ourselves? Let's accept the pruning of Yahweh if he's pruning us. Let's purge out the leaven and the old let the old man die so the Yahshua, the Anointed One, the Messiah, can be on the throne of our hearts. We just have to accept him as our king. And allow him to reign over us. We cannot allow this self-rule to go on any longer. This satanic rule to overwhelm us and overtake us. Do we want Yahshua to reign over us? Or do we want to reign over ourselves? That's the question. Which one is it? You can't have both. There's only one king. And you're not it. You can try to be your own king. But the truth is you need one. And we have one king, the king of kings. In a parable, Yahshua said, For I say to you, everyone who has will be given. For him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. We've got to be good stewards of what we have. Or what we do have can be taken away from us. And he said, But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. And so do we want... Yahshua to say that to us. That we didn't want him to reign over us. See, that which we have can be taken away. And so it's time for Yahshua to reign now in our hearts. We're all going to die anyway. Might as well die believing the good news and let self die now anyway. So he can reign over us. Now, even though Yahshua is a king, what's that mean for him to reign over us? Even though Yahshua is a king, you know what? Nothing seemed to be beneath him in terms of service. Because on the same night he taught his disciples about partaking of him, our Passover lamb, he taught them what it means to be a king. In John chapter 13, verse 3, Yahshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and he had come from Elohim, was going to Elohim, rose from supper, and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured out water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then came, he came to Simon Kepha, and Kepha said to him, Master, are you washing my feet? 
Yahushua answered and said to him, What I am doing now you do not understand, but you will know after this. Cephas said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Yahushua answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Cephas said to him, Master, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Then he came, oh, sorry. Next section. Um, Yahushua said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and master, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your master and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. See, we do this actually on the night of Passover. Just before we partake of the Passover lamb, we wash one another's feet. And um, it prepares our hearts. It humbles us in preparation for partaking of the Messiah, making sure that we don't partake of that in an unworthy manner. And so he says, Blessed are you if you do them. And to me, this just highlights and underscores the importance that Yahshua placed on serving. Here is the King of Kings, washing feet. Nothing was beneath him. And so for us, brothers, here's a question and a challenge I have for you and for myself. Are you washing the feet of your brothers and sisters? Are you serving them? Are you serving other believers in the Messiah? In what ways have you served the brethren today? That's my challenge to you. If we can't think of anything, that we are even doing anything to serve the brothers in Messiah, then how can we say that we're doing these things? How can we say we're his disciple? If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now I know that distance often separates us from being able to serve one another as we would like to. But you know, we're not on this journey alone. And there are things we can do to serve each other, even remotely, from a distance. And even though we are set apart by miles, we're not separated in the spirit, in the spiritual realm. And we are in this wilderness together. Just as the children of Israel were in the wilderness together, we're in this wilderness together. And how many times Yahweh defines himself by this act. I'm Yahweh who brought you out of Egypt into the land that, that you're in. And so Yahweh will define, well, he will define himself, it says in Jeremiah, again, by bringing us into that, that land. And so, brothers, he wants to bring us out of Egypt, out of that self-serving, self-focused uh, lifestyle and to an others-focused lifestyle. One that involves serving. That's what Yahshua came to do. He came to serve, not to be served, but to serve. And so what are we doing to serve? What are we doing to build the kingdom of Elohim? If we're only building our own little kingdom, our own little sandcastle, the tsunami is going to come and wash it away, brothers. But if we're building a kingdom and a building, a spiritual building for Yahweh, that is a building that will stand forever. And so what's more important? And every time you step out and serve your brothers, you're building the kingdom 
of Elohim. That's a very important thing. There's hardly anything more important. And so we are together on this wilderness trek. And we need to build this kingdom in the spirit. He wants to bring us out of Egypt. We don't need to be pointing captains and going back there. A lot, a lot of people, a lot of captains are wanting to bring you back to Egypt and say, Oh, you can have the goods of Egypt and be in the wilderness. Yahshua said, it's hard for a rich man to have a kingdom. Don't appoint them to be your captain. Let Yahshua be your captain. We look, we see the great work that Yahweh has done to reveal to us his awesome plan. And so every year, this is the blessing of keeping the feast, every year you have this reminder, this thing always sitting in front of you, that we need to get focused and get that old sin out of our life and press on toward the goal, the high calling of Messiah Yahshua. Even if no one goes with us, even if we're just like Caleb and Joshua, two men that make it, we've still got to go. We can't fear the enemy's bread for us. We don't have anything to be afraid of. We have the most powerful being in the universe with us. Why should we fear? And so we press on toward that promised land, toward that land of hope where Righteousness will reign. Yahweh will be the king. And so this year, diligently seek out that leaven in your homes and in your hearts that Yahweh wants to purge out. Let's set aside our own things, building our own little kingdoms. And this year, let's build his kingdom. Let's allow him to reign over us at all times. This year, every minute of every day, bringing the King of Kings into our home and into our hearts for good. And through it all, brothers, we can have a great time of rejoicing. Even through the trials, a great time of rejoicing. And it'll be nothing compared to the time of rejoicing awaiting us. But we can still rejoice in Yahweh always. Again, I say, Rejoice. And if you can't rejoice, then for the joy that's set before you, as Messiah endured the tree, for the joy that was set before him, so can we. As, as we do so, may Yahweh bless you, and may Yahweh have mercy on each and every one of us. Mm -hmm.